this week's episode of The Good Gram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Right, okay, so Sunday chores out of the way and it's time to do something a little bit more interesting. Um, so, yes, as you can see from this week's uh, title page, we're looking at Tomatin again. Uh, no excuses for doing another episode on Tomatin. Um, as you know, I'm you know, quite partial to a bit of Tomatin and um, the distillery kindly keeps sending me samples or um, the rep keeps dropping in with samples which is which is very very nice and very appreciated so uh, a big thank you to the distillery for the samples for this week's episode of the show with the exception of, of, of this one they're not quite that generous um, but they're, they're, you know, I'm, not, I'm not complaining about the generosity I mean you know it's it's always nice to to sort of you know get samples of, of forthcoming stuff um, which is part of the reason for this week's episode of the show um, in actual fact there's, there's there's three reasons really I mean the first is that I've just collected enough samples to do an episode of the show uh, including a couple of rather nice old bottlings um, the second reason is uh, for uh, one of these bottlings uh, which I'll obviously get onto in due course is a UK exclusive and has not yet actually been released so I'm hoping this is actually going to be the first well, YouTube or review anywhere of this particular bottling as it's not actually hit the shelves yet. Um, and the third reason is, well, because I wanted to look at some blends. I mean, um, there's still an element of snobbery with regards to, to blends, which, you know, uh, I'm not saying it's all down to me, but there are a number of, uh, of, of whiskey commentators that are, you know, doing their best to sort of, you know, debunk myths and say you know things that, that we as whiskey aficionados well know that you know nothing wrong with a good blended whiskey there and unfortunately there are a lot of poor blended whiskies on on the market um but you know blended whiskies is the backbone of the the, the whiskey industry without the blends half of the distilleries and probably more than half of the distilleries would cease to exist i mean yes nowadays you can argue that a distillery can indeed stand on its own two feet purely by bottling a single malt and you know, there is a huge interest in 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 the single malt market as, as we well know um but you know the backbone of the industry is still the blends and you know single malt bottlings account for a very small proportion of the overall global sales of whiskey and um so you know it's we're looking at the antiquary range which i think is is a, a very classy range and a range which i stock um so um well not really a great deal else to say but we'll we'll have a look at today's lineup Right, okay, so like I said, we're going to kick off with the Antiquary range, which is or was um, and still is, as far as I'm aware, owned by uh, J.W. Hardy, which is now owned by Tomatin. And as far as I'm aware, the uh, malt component of the blend is quite complex. I think it's about 14 different malts that make up the the malt component certainly tomatin being the basis that uh, i believe ardbeg and is used as well but as for the other ones i couldn't honestly tell you a mix of highland and space i one would imagine um so we're going to kick off with a no age statement which is i think still really really good value for money i mean i have it on the shelf at under 20 quid and tell me what else can you get for less than 20 quid these days not an awful lot um, yes there is a relatively high grain content which is what you would expect from a young blended whiskey the grain is the cheaper component so just to keep the costs down yes you are going to have more grain but that does not necessarily mean it's a poor quality product I mean you can certainly see from the color no caramel and that is the biggest issue with so many of the blends you look at the blends you think oh well they're made up of, of you know some good quality raw materials and then they just stuff a load of e150 in it and just completely ruin it um so anyway we're going to kick off with the no age statement bottled at um 40 percent then we're going to look at the 12 year old again bottled at um 40 percent and this i'm i'm guessing that i don't know for exact that uh, proportion of malt to grain with regards to the no age statement bottling but i'm guessing it's around about 30 70 malt to grain or there or thereabouts the 12 however is 50 50 and for something that's what mid 20s 
And I still think, again, can't argue with that. Uh, third one we're going to be looking at is this one. This is the 21 year old. This is bottled at 43 quid and it's a little bit more expensive. Um, but, you know, you compare that to a 21 year old single malt um, price wise and, you know, you're still getting a, you know, a, well, I say bargain, but you're, you're getting a, you know, a, a lot for your money, should we say. Then we're going to move on to three of the Tom and Tin bottlings themselves and this is the one that I was on about this is the UK exclusive uh, this is a 12 year old uh, French oak finish apparently it was distilled in 2006 um, and is either being bottled in at this present moment in time or is due to be bottled uh, it's made up of two casks 33271 and 272 it spent four years in American oak and eight years finishing in French oak now before you think say Oof, dick God, eight years in French oak. Bear in mind that French oak is not American oak. I know that's a bit of an obvious thing to say, but the makeup is what I'm talking about. French oak, as a number of you well know, is uh, a lot tighter grained, a lot less porous than American oak. You won't get huge, mighty vanillins from French oak. What you tend to get is a nice, tight, tannic kind of structure and so I'm not expecting this to be sort of blasted by vanilla um, yeah there might be a fair amount of tannin going on in there but you know we shall we shall see what uh, uh, what that comes up with so like I said UK exclusive about 50 quid bit, possibly a bit expensive for a 12 year old um, but again like I said it's essentially a very small batch bottling uh, then we're going to really jump up in the age statements. We're going to look at the um, new 30-year-old. Well, I say new. This was released, uh, actually, yes, it was. It was released January of this year. Um, probably the wrong time of the year, truth be honest, to release a bloody expensive whiskey. I mean, you know, we've just got over Christmas. Uh, January is never going to be the busiest month. And then out pops this, you know. Anyway, um, so this is batch one. Um, and um, it's uh, all American oak, so 75% of it was first fill bourbon and 25% was it refill bourbon. Goes on the shelf or uh, online for around about £299, which again, I think is pretty good value for a 30-year-old whiskey. Um, incidentally, it's not the first time they've bottled a 30-year-old. They bottled one back in 2013 when they had the, the old livery, you know, the red and uh, white and black uh, labelling. Uh, I believe that's now going for around about six hundred pound a bottle. So when you think about that, yeah, that's 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 a bit of a bargain, really. And finally, we're going to be looking at the uh, well last year's uh, thirty-six-year-old release. This is batch number four, uh, and it is a combination of uh, well bourbon casks finished in Oloroso. Uh, so. They spent about uh, 29 years in American Oak before being finished in uh, Oloroso for seven years. 66% uh, of those Oloroso casks were first fill and 34% of those casks were refill. So, um, and, and as you know, I, I think Tomerton do a really good job of the use of sherry casks. They're very judicious with their use and come up with, you know, I think sort of really nicely balanced whiskies. So um, looking forward to, to tasting that and sharing that with you guys. So there you go. That's the lineup uh, for this week's episode. I think it's going to be um, going to be quite a fun episode. Right, okay. So we're going to kick off with a no age statement and queer. Let's uh, see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Quite dense, quite broad, um, getting quite a lot of malt on the nose to kick off with. So I'm getting sort of, you know, you know juicy um, apricot and um, apple, some lovely lithe barley, shall we say, and um, some nice crisp, fresh grain. It's got a, a nice a nice edge to it um, and that's what I like about good quality blends bringing in the grain component just gives it a different dimension um, and as long as you're not sort of going oh my god all I can taste is really young grain then that, that's fine um, I mean it's not 
over endued with complexity shall we say but you know for, like I said for 20 quid this is a really nice nose um, it's a little bit of a little bit of sweet peat smoke but you know altogether I think this is pretty well crafted it has to be said Let's see what the power's like A little bit more heavier on the grain on the palate. Kicks off with a little bit of creaminess, a little bit of vanilla. Grain comes in fairly quickly, a little bit of dried fruit, but more of that sort of edgy, grainy kind of character, that sort of slight spiciness as well. A touch of smoke on the finish. Malt does kind of come back on the finish, but it is a little austere on the finish. Um, but again, you know, for 20 quid that is really well put together there's no caramel no flattening of the palate no deadening it's got a lovely vibrancy of freshness and you know this is again like i said it's not overly complex <laughs> you're not going to get that for for 20 quid at the end of the day but what you do get is a really nice mouthful so you know good start <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the toy grill. Let's uh, see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Like the No Age Statement bottling, it has a really pleasant malty nose. There's obviously a little bit more maturity happening here. Touch of malt biscuits. Dry peat smoke. Slightly macerated apricot. Um, Again, that is a really nice nose. I'm not getting a huge amount of grain. There is a little bit just at the edges. It's giving it that sort of slight, um, fresh, almost citric kind of uh, edge to uh, to the nose. But again, yeah, you know, we, we, we're talking a lot of malt. I mean, this is 50% malt. I mean, you know, so um, and certainly on the nose, it's 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 punching well above that uh, its weight, shall we say. Anyway, let's see what the parts like. Mmm, that is a lovely finish. Getting the peat smoke coming through on the finish there. Slightly dusty, slightly violety. Um, a bit drying. A um, bit tannic on, on, on the aftertaste, but I'm certainly getting a, a little bit of dark chocolate, which is really quite nice. Again, the palate is quite malt dominated. It kicks off with a lot of malt and rich fruit. Um, the grain component is less crisp, less fresh, more of the dried fruits that you would expect from um, a sort of, a, well, I, say, I would say, a beginning to mature grain. Um, but you know, in grain terms, it's still a bit of a baby at 12 years old. But it does give out a little bit of dried fruit. Um, like I say, it's got a nice chewiness as well. Um, I, I really like that. I think that's really quite impressive. Again, for sort of like mid 20s, uh, I think it's about mid 20s. I probably should have sort of checked, but I think off the top of my head, we're looking at mid 20s or maybe sort of slightly less than 30 quid so you know I don't know I still think it's really good value for money and I think if you're just after an everyday sort of um, uh, sopping whiskey for want of a better word then you can't go too far wrong with that at all. Right okay so let's move on to the 21 year old so this is bottled at a slightly higher ABV of 43% um, let's see what those gives us now that is nice. Um, again, lots of malt character. A um, little bit more oak now. Um, I mean, there was a touch on, on, on the 12-year-old. Not a great deal of oak at all on the No Age Statement bottling. But um, this has got that starting to develop slightly sawdusty kind of mature oak character. Apricot malt, a little bit of licorice. 
a lovely combination of, of grain as well. I'm getting a little bit of, of, of sort of high tone, sort of almost rummy kind of dried fruits. Um, but there's also a, a slight crisp spiciness there as well. Um, and again, it's got vibrancy. It's got, a, and that's the grain element. Uh, you know, what the grain element brings to the table, should we say? Um, but that's got a lovely dense, lovely dense malt nose. Really, really impressive. Mm, let's see what that's Oh, that's one hell of a finish. Wonderfully mature. Again, lots of malt character. Mature apricot, apple, barley, touch of dusty oak, a little bit of spice, a little bit of tannin on the finish, um, dried fruit from the grain element, and a, a little bit of a grip as well, a little bit of citric sort of edginess on, on the finish. Really, really well balanced. It has to be said. Um, and the other thing about the Antiqui range that I really like is 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 the, the the funky bottle shape. It has to be said. I mean, I know at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how uh, well packaged and all that kind of stuff. It's about the juice, and the juice is really good. So, and uh, I mean, I, I know that the the range was um, revamped a few years ago, uh, and I'm glad they kind of kept the, the very distinctive kind of you know cut glassy, oh, oh hello, um, feel of the character of the bottle because I think it's quite got a lovely unique kind of look to it and uh, uh, I mean I guess w when you're rebranding and talking of rebranding they're currently in the process of rebranding the Kubokan range um, it's always it's a difficult one because you either sort of like say well look okay we have a bit of a heritage this is a very distinctive bottle shape which we want to kind of keep um, but of course that narrows your parameters to uh, um, updating uh, a brand, I suppose. And I think they've done a really nice job of, uh, of, of, of treading that fine line. So not only do I think the product looks really good, it tastes really good as well. So, you know, big thumbs up, as they say. Isn't that right, Woody Cat? Okay, so let's move on to the first of the three Tomatin bottlings. This is the uh, French oak finish. Let's see what the nose gives us. Off the bat, very obvious French oak. Oh, well, to me it's very obvious. It's got that tight, grainy kind of character. Um, a little bit of, a little bit of tight vanilla. I love the tautness that you get with um with French oak but beneath that you've got some lovely malt there's a little bit of a little bit of dark darker not quite treacly malt but dark malt macerated fruit again apricot a little bit of possibly fig um possibly prune the fruit has got a really sort of dark edge to it but we're not talking sort of quite sherry sort of darkness um there's a touch of minerality, there's a touch of sort of, of, of highland minerality coming through, there's a little bit of, of green gauge, lime. I mean that is really nicely balanced. Yes, the oak is the obvious centerpiece of this, this particular nose, but it is no way is it is it overly dominating. Um, there's some sweet almost banana-y notes and a little bit of thread of vanilla kind of coming through. I mean that, that is just a gorgeous nose, that really is, and it's different, but it's not too weird, if you see what I mean. Um, anyway, um, off you go. This is um, just a damn good nose, let's see what the power's like. Kicks off with a little bit more vanilla, a little bit more of the American oak, but 
French oak really comes in fairly quickly with, with that sort of gritty, tight, tannic kind of character. It's a bit compressed, um, but there's still some lovely juicy fruit. It's got a lovely weight of malt and slightly dark fruit, not quite as dark as the nose would suggest. Got a little bit of, 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 of cho chocolate, a little bit of both milk and dark chocolate on the finish and lovely spiciness. My tongue is tingling quite nicely. Um, again, there's a bit of minerality um, and it has a wonderful progression. So we kind of like a little bit of American oak first, in comes the French oak, finally comes the malt. Um, and then we're back to sort of like, you know, a little bit of sort of, you know, French oak tannins right on the finish. And I just think that is just absolutely superb. Really, really good quality. And, you know, I really think you should buy it when it's re when it's a house and about. Right, okay, so a bit of a bit of an age jump, shall we say? So this is the 30-year-old uh, 100 percent American oak, which I always like. Um, none of your sherry gubbings here, it has to be said. Um, let's see what the nose gives us. Ooh, mother, that's good. Um, Crisp, fresh, granity, very Highland uh, in character. Um, getting lots of green fruit, gooseberry, lime. Some lovely, dusty, old American oak. Um, but I'm also getting some, some, some lovely vanillins, a little bit of toffee. Um, touch of spice. Oh! Damn, that is really, really good. I mean, yes, it's £299, um, but, oh, that is a nose. Um, really, really complex. Um, it's kind of one of those sort of noses that really kind of, you stick your nose in and just go boom, sort of pretty much at you. It's not not a huge oak monster, but it, it, it does kind of like um, open up really quickly um, and sort of pretty much displays everything in one go and you sort of go... Oh, what's that? What's that? I mean, it's not one of these sort of whiskies that kind of you need to spend a huge amount of time with to sort of like unpick and unwind. I mean, admittedly, I've had had it in the glass for for a few minutes now, so it has kind of like you know had an opportunity to aerate a little bit. Um, but oh, I mean, the balance between maturity and sort of freshness is is absolutely spot on. It's really, really very, very good smell that all day but then I've got the 36 year old to come so anyway let's see what the power's like mm. kicks off with the malt juicy ripe apricots and barley and apple and a little bit of pear and a touch of banana um, wonderful sort of citric middle, middle and finish um, the oak kind of sort of moves in on on the mid palate so you're getting that sort of dusty American oak that sawdusty kind of mature oak kind of character um, then you're getting the minerality um, the citrus the green gauge the gooseberry um, it's a little austere on the finish, but I like the palate cleansing nature of, of, of that austerity. Um, and, you know, it, it's just got so much kind of weight and depth to it. I mean, it really, really is impressive, it has to be said. Um, and I must admit, it's, it's weird that, you know, I love American oak aged whiskies, as you well know, but the one uh, wholly American oak aged whisky in or bottling in their core range, the 18, I don't know whether they still do that or not, I've kind of lost track of that one, it has to be said, was I never really warmed to. I was, you know, always of the mindset that Tomatin really needed a little bit of sherry, or should we say, seemed to be at its best with a little bit of sherry, but... Ooh, that's... <laughs> right, okay, so... Talking of uh, uh, American oak and a bit of Oloroso, let's move on to the 36 year old. Let's see what the nose gives us on this. So, um, this it obviously is not cheap. Uh, I mean, we're talking, you know, a shade under 600 odd quid, but just, just think about it for a minute. 
36 year old whiskey if this was a Highland Park or a Macallan or you know one of those other distilleries you know you would be looking at silly money I mean admittedly I mean and this is I think Tomatin are you know, pretty good with their pricing structure it has to be said they uh, you know they the the sort of lower end of the range I think is all still really well priced and yes all right you can you can say yes they're making their money on the older stuff I mean the, the, what I can't remember how many thousands the the 50 year old that they just released you know, tail end of last year was um, arguably I think it was overpriced for a 50 year old but you can't blame them for kind of you know making their money out of that one and, and if, as long as they keep sort of right you know the the, the, the legacy and the, the 12 year old at a you know good price uh, which they do then you know it's that's the bread and butter isn't it you know anyway um, let's have a look at, uh, at this particular bottle and see what the nose is going to give us Now that has got a lovely maturity, and the, the thing I love about sh old sherry casks is that sort of dusty spice, that dusty dried fruit, mingling in with dusty American oak, um, bit of vanilla, sort of uh, just a, a wonderful aged rancio uh, of dried fruits and dried American fruits and dried sherry fruits and spice, a little bit of chocolate. Oh, but it's still got this wonderful vibrancy and this is what I love about Tomatin. It just seems to retain that highland, granity, vibrant kind of character. Um, yet it's still got a lovely richness to it. Um, American oak is getting a little bit buttery now with time. I mean, obviously, you know, you're expecting the American oak to be more of a centre point because the fact it spent 20 odd years, 29 years in American oak casks. And again, the finishing is very judicious. It's just adding that little bit of dried fruit character, that little bit of um, so mature feeling um, uh, sherry notes. Um, I mean, obviously, that's a sort of an illusion because of the sort of maturity of the, the malt itself, rather than the maturity of the, of the actual sherry um, cask itself. I mean, that is just an absolutely stunning nose, really vibrant but mature. Ooh, let's see what the parts like. Wow, my God, that finish is just incredibly good. It's a lot more minerally um, than I remember. I mean, I've, bought, I've tasted batch one, three and four now, um, and I still think batch number one was just my personal favourite. It's the one that I've still got in stock, but this is still absolutely gorgeous. It's a little bit more um, austere and minerally than I remember batch number one. Um, it's still sort of centred around the American oak, uh, so you're getting sort of dusty American oak, getting a bit of cream, bit of bit of toffee. Uh, there's a little bit of dried fruit kind of coming through, uh, a little bit of sherry spice, really harmoniously balanced. And again, that finish has got that lovely sort of grapefruit, gooseberry, um, minerally sort of citric kind of character, which cleanses the palate. Um, but it leaves behind a slight sort of chocolatey tannic residue. Um, I mean, I, I mean, it's a stunning, absolutely stunning whiskey. It has to be said, and and it's sort of it would be lovely to do a sort of a, you know a tasting of all all four of those batches, but I don't think that's ever going to happen somehow. Um, and just in my memory, I just remember sort of batch one being. Um, the one that I, maybe it's because it was the first one I tasted. Who knows? It's it just the one that sort of I really, really thought. Yes, I've got to buy that. I don't care what how much it's going to cost. And, and yes, we've still got some bottles of it. I mean, it's not sort of you know um, bottle that's going to sort of like fly off the shelves every day of the week. But damn, that's bloody good. That's all I can say. <laughs> Right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. So, like I said, uh, B 
big big thank you to Thomas in for the samples for today's episode of the show um, and obviously a big thank you to you guys for continually watching uh, the show commenting um, emailing all that kind of stuff you know it's uh, uh, it's nice to know that sort of you know you're enjoying what I'm doing um, because I'm enjoying doing it you know uh, anyway so like I said uh, right at the beginning of the show um, don't forget about blended whiskies. I mean, it was quite interesting. I had a did a tasting in the evening in the shop a few months ago, and I put this particular the, the no age stamp antiquity up against. I think it was uh, famous grouse blind. Sent them both round and said, you know, what do you think? Uh, and and it's just just beat the pants off the, off the grouse. Has to be said. And, and the only reason. The caramel, like I said, you know, you look at uh, uh, the components of Famous Grouse and you think, you know, well, yes, you know, the components are not too shabby and then you just ruin it all by just chucking loads of of caramel at it and it's flat and it's boring and it's dull, which is definitely not the case of the, the No Age Statement Antiquity. It's got a lovely vibrancy, a lovely, fresh, crisp kind of character. Yes, not hugely complex, but bang for your buck, you know, 20 quid anyway moving on to the 12 year old again lovely balance really nice um, combination of, of, of you know, getting their age malt and grain um, the malt certainly sort of like you know is the focal point of that with the grain playing you know a nice kind of second fiddle which is definitely what you want with a, a really nice blend and the 21 year old well, yeah just a, a very very fine whiskey uh, and just showcases what a good blend is all about moving on to the malts um the 12 year old french oak really really like that i love the use of french oak uh in whiskey i would like to see sort of you know a little bit you know different oaks kind of used you know don't just kind of settle on sort of like you know american oak and sherry and maybe the occasional French oak cask, you know, um, I'm sure there are distilleries that are having a playing around with, with, with things like maple and birch and larch and all these different types of oak and I'm sure some of them kind of work and I'm sure some of them probably are destined to, to, to failure but anyway, um, like I said, I really like the use of French oak and yes, it might seem like it's spent an awful long time in the French oak and yes, the French oak is obvious uh, obviously noticeable, which bloody hope it would be, um, but it's really balanced and really interesting and um, I really like that. And like I said, it's a UK exclusive, but obviously if you're living outside of the UK, you can obviously purchase it on the website when it's up there. Um, and um, anyway, so moving on to the 30 year old, like I said, the only thing that was wrong with that, it was released at the wrong bloody time of the year. That's all I can say. Um, or should I say, I got the sample at the wrong time of the year. You know, January, never a good time for releasing expensive whiskies. I mean, it's never a good time for releasing whiskies full stop, you know, at the end of the day. But anyway, as a whiskey itself, just been really, really good. Um, lovely packaging, love the, love the whole sort of wooden boxy thing and all that kind of stuff, but uh, um, the juice, as they say, is damn good. And the 36 year old, well, yeah, what can you say? I mean, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, again, lovely packaging sort of along the lines of the 30 year old, lovely wooden box, etc, etc. Um, but the juice is just, just really, really good. So, um, yeah absolutely stunning stuff so you know i think sort of it's quite quite right that sort of you know tomatin continue to get sort of like the accolades for being sort of you know innovative uh, and always looking to sort of like evolve and change um but the, the one thing that they certainly don't compromise on as far as i can see is the quality of the uh, of the liquid that they're releasing and um Let's hope that, can, that continues. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the show. Um, what's left to say is good afternoon and good ramming. <laughs>